Thank you, Jane. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. I was talking to somebody that today, and uh, we were just commenting that, you know, church um, is good when you just can gather in any um, way or form with other people, but it is just, I guess we learned this last year, it's just different whether or not you're inside the house with each other, um, even when we're having to keep a little bit of a distance, and so it is good to see you guys um, today. Uh, let me tell you a couple things as we uh, get started today. Um, because you have continued to be faithful in giving, and I don't know if there's any other churches that have been um, as faithful as you guys have been, um, I've said this to you before, but more than once when we have had to stop meeting, as the, the first time I say, um, okay, we're not going to start meeting, we're going to have to go back to online this next week, the first question you guys have is, so what do we do with our tithe? And, and it is, I kind of chuckle, but it's because you're concerned about that. And because you have continued to be faithful, we've done several things um, while we have been out. Um, for about uh, six weeks, I think, in a row, we took food up to nurses at Henry Medical Center. Um, some of the nurses that normally work days were working nights, and when they were not doing surgeries, they weren't doing um, same-day surgeries because, well, any surgeries that, they didn't, that weren't emergency, because they were holding patients that they didn't have any other rooms for. And so some of the day nurses were having to work night shifts so that they could just tend to those patients. So for about six weeks, we took um, food, and we went to different places, um, Chick-fil-A, um, Firehouse Subs, places that had them make meals, and then we would take them up at um, 9 or 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, to serve them. So I got a thank you note this last week from, um, I think we did every floor in the hospital and we would do 25 or 30 each night. So we did, I don't know how many we did, um, 150 or 200 meals um, over those weeks. But that was because you were faithful in giving. So thank you for that. Um, and so I got a thank you note from them this last week. Several of you have asked about um, the food pantry. Um, and if you drive by here, sometimes there's food in it all the way to the doors, that's because we just loaded it and people haven't been by every single day. Sometimes in a matter of two or three hours, all of the food goes, but every single day people are coming by and getting food. Um, and so um, that's another ministry because you continue to be faithful to give. And so we have, I told you this at the beginning um, when um, somebody came up with it, Donna Bell came up with this um, idea. She had seen it and to be truthful, I wasn't sure whether it would really be all that great of a need. Um, and the week after she asked me about it, David Robinson at, the, at, the, uh, at Ingalls said, hey, I've got um, some food. Um, could you take like 50 bags of food and do something with it? <laughs> well, then when I, when I went to pick up the food, he gave me a, 130 bags of food. Um, now, we've gone through all of that, um, but I'm not sure that thing has cost us hardly anything, both because of what's been given and because of what you um, guys um, have given. So thank you for continuing uh, to give. We continue to do uh, ministry, and we will continue to do that um, through this next year. Um, several people to, to pray for. One that I heard of this morning that I'll just ask you, you won't know this, um, Lady Pam Grassley, uh, Bonnie Larrabee's, it, it's her daughter-in-law's mother, has got several medical needs. And then this last week apparently has fallen and shattered her uh, um, arm, and so she just got several things. So um, among others, as I pray this morning, will you just lift up this lady, Pam Grassley? Isn't it great that you can pray for somebody and you really don't have to know who it is or what all's going on? Um, there are lots of times I pray better when I just know somebody needs prayer, because you know what I do when I know exactly what their problem is? Well, I know exactly how to tell them how to fix it, and I, that's what I tell God is how to fix it. He doesn't need me telling him that. I just lift him up in prayer, and he does the rest. So you do that and pray for other needs that are on your heart this morning as we start. Father, thank you for uh, this day, and I do thank you for another day to be um, literally inside your house. I know some will gather um, with us again this week online, and I'm thankful for the ability. Um, who would have thought that um, our church would gather as many times as we did in the last 12 months um, around televisions in separate houses um, to be able to worship, and I'm, I am very thankful for that. And for those that need to continue to do that, um, I'm very thankful. But um, I'm so thankful that uh, things have reached a point where we can gather in this uh, same room, um, where we can um, lift our voices, even with masks on. We can lift our voices and sing praises to you, uh, that we can uh, open your word, uh, that we can worship. 
And so I, I, I thank you for your love, and I thank you for um, where you have brought us. I know for almost everyone in this room, uh, someone close to them, even a family member, um, uh, a child, a sibling, almost everybody lost someone in this last year. Um, I thank you that you saw us through that um, heartache um, and pain, um, but I do thank you for the times that we can rejoice and be um, together as we worship. I pray this morning for uh, Kim and for several of our youth that are out um, at a retreat that they've had this weekend, and as I have seen uh, some of the pictures of them gathered around um, a table seeming to be earnestly um, studying and thinking um, about you and about your word. I pray that you just would use the time that they spent this um, weekend um, to literally uh, change their lives. I uh, pray that you'd help them to focus more on you um, because of what they've done this weekend. And now for this service, for uh, the time we spend uh, singing and opening your word uh, to study, I pray that you would take our efforts and receive them as um, a praise offering to you because that is why we worship today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Andrew? Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. Donna Janice are out of town, and I so appreciate him asking me to lead the music today. It's so good to see you, and I want to give some love out to our friends and uh, family, Grace family and friends that are worshiping at home. We love you, too, and I'm glad you're with us. Um, so I have loved these sermons from Hebrews 11 uh, about faith. It, I, I have just loved them. And today, Kenny's going to talk about how faith gives us the victory even in suffering. And you know what? You don't get very far along in this life before you, you go through a little suffering. Some of you have known more suffering than I have. Um, our, we have Christian brothers and sisters all around the world who face horrible persecution and, uh, and fear of death as they worship uh, the one true God. And we need to always remember them, too. But you know what? Nobody knows suffering better than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, does he? And here as we're approaching Easter, did you know next Sunday's Palm Sunday? Yeah, so y'all get your Palm Sunday duds ready, and then Easter's the next week. So, um, but at Grace, we are continually thankful for, uh, for Jesus and what he's done for us. So we're going to start with a Christmas song. This is Oh, Sing a Song of Bethlehem. Oh, 
song. Now we're going to sing one you're a little more familiar with, The Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley, in him alone I see all I need to cleanse and make. coming to to read our scripture this morning at this time right now right right yeah, yes so uh come on up scott um normally there's scott and sherry brambilla but since everybody that's leading in worship today has the last name heath we're adopting them <laughs> just for a short time and thank you so much for doing that <laughs> thanks mom <laughs> <laughs> uh Good morning, Grace family. It's so good to see you all here this uh, first Sunday of spring. I look forward to seeing your faces again one of these days. That'll be great. Uh, if you could turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're going to read this morning verses 35 through 38. And once you find your way, if you could please stand with me to, uh, for the reading of God's word. I'm going to start in, uh, in the middle of verse 35. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Thank you. Be seated. Thank you, sir. Yeah, today I have four sons for a little while, just like the Shirouses. Okay. I'm sorry, I got a little lost there. Okay. Now we're going to sing Blessed Redeemer. Death on the cross, that he might save. 
Okay, we're going to sing a little chorus that I think you are very familiar with. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. a special treat this morning. I think it's a special treat. My oldest granddaughter, Aubrey Heath, is going to come and sing How Beautiful. Uh, Twyla Paris is sung from a long time ago, but it's a wonderful song. How beautiful is the body of Christ. Hey, baby. And I can't hardly sing this song at home without crying, so I may get a little teary today since my granddaughter's singing it. But, uh, Beautiful when humble hearts 
the fruit of pure life so that others may live how beautiful how beautiful how beautiful is the body Thank you, Aubrey. Well, we continue on. That's a good song to help us as we continue on in our uh, study of Hebrews. We're getting close to the end. We've got this week and uh, next week we'll finish up this uh, 11th chapter of uh, Hebrews. I think I showed you uh, a few weeks ago it's gotten easier for me to find Hebrews chapter 11 because it has come completely out of my Bible. Um, I'm going to have to get uh, some super glue or something to put it back in there. Um, but it's been a good study. We've been in here since uh, November. Um, and the, the series we've been doing, we've been talking about growing in faith. And for almost all of the, this series, we've looked at the various ways that, um, that you demonstrate faith, how that, how that comes out. So we, we've talked about faith, and faith is the uh, confidence in unseen realities. Now, it's not just confidence in um, a hope and a wish and a whatever. It, it has to be something real. And true biblical faith has got to be based on something. Well, it's based on the Word of God. So that's what faith is and what it's based on. And then faith will always produce some action. Do you remember this verse um, in James that says, Faith without works is dead. And so what, it, what that means is, if you say you have faith, but there's not any action at all, you don't really have faith. Now, sometimes people do some good things. I know some really good people. I know some really good people that absolutely do not believe in God. And, and you don't have to look at their life. They would tell you if you would ask them. They just don't believe there's a God. But they are really, really nice people. And so if you looked at them, you might see some good works in their life. Good works does not produce faith. Good works does not produce salvation. But if you have faith, or say you do, and there is no good works at all, you have confused yourself. Because faith without works is dead. Faith without works doesn't really exist. So um, you don't have to work on trying to have enough faith that you'll have some good works, because it's just a natural byproduct. You can't have faith and not have works. You can have works and not have faith. So faith will produce some kind of action. And that's what we've seen in this whole chapter as we've gone through. Um, time after time, we have looked at the people that have faith and then seen the action. Then last week and this week, we've shifted gears just a little bit. We're looking at a, a related theme, but it's not the exact same. We're not talking so much about how um, uh, what you do when you have faith, but we're talking about what faith does. What, what, do you, what does faith do? If you have faith and it produces action, what does the faith end up doing? Um, what does faith um, accomplish? Last week, we said this, that it, uh, faith, it conquers, it overcomes, it prevails, 
it triumphs. We really kind of summed all of it up with saying, faith is victorious. Faith is the victory. Um, you can, if you have faith, you can never lose. If you don't have faith, you can never win. 1 John 5, 4 says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That is what has overcome the world. It is your faith that overcomes the world. Now, last week we looked at how faith makes you triumphant in victory, but that's only part of the story. Um, this week we're going to look and see how faith can make you triumphant even in suffering. Um, we all love the victory part, don't we? Um, I like to play um, sports and be involved um, in those, um, and I, I, I always like to play, and I always like to win. I, I don't ever like to lose. Now, I can be a good sport, but I, I don't enjoy losing. I enjoy winning, and most people do um, to a major uh, uh, level. So as you exercise your faith in God, you are going to know many times when you have exciting, thrilling victories, um, when God will act on your behalf, and, and so you'll know many good victories. But what do you do about the times when the victory is um, just not there? What about the times when you believe God for something, and it just, it just doesn't happen? What, what do you do then? What, what do you do when you, you know, sometimes you pray for healing, and healing comes. But what do you do when you pray for healing and then you don't get healed? Um, why does God rescue some people from danger and then other people suffer calamity? Um, those, are, those are really difficult questions to ask. Um, some people try to chalk all of it up to faith or a lack of faith. Some will say that anything good that happens means you have faith. And whenever bad things happen or the good things don't happen, that it's a lack of faith. You know what that's called? That is prosperity theology. That is exactly what it is. Prosperity theology will teach that God wants all of us to be healthy and wealthy all of the time. And that if you have any sickness or any difficulty, it's always due to a lack of faith. That's a lie. That is, that is not true. Um, and, it, and it doesn't line up with Scripture at all. It doesn't line up with Scripture as a whole. And, and what are we basing our faith on? The Word of God. So if it doesn't line up with Scripture, then, then it's wrong. And it not only doesn't line up with Scripture in general, it doesn't line up exactly with, at all with the Scripture that we're looking at here. Hebrews chapter 11 lists all of these people who, through faith, have been triumphant in victory. And we've seen that all the way down through verse 35. And then we get to verse 35. None of you said anything to me last week about the fact that we went through 35, but if you were following along in your Bible, we only made it halfway through the verse. We did the first half of the verse, but we didn't do the second half of the verse. And that is when we're going to pick up. And in this same verse, not even the next verse, and I know God didn't put the verse numbers in there. Somebody else put those in. But in the same verse, without taking a breath, without some qualifying statement about what we're going to next, he goes right on to talk about those who... Um, through their faith, were triumphant through suffering as well. Both groups of people are listed as heroes of faith, and yet one group experienced victory, and another group experiences suffering. So faith makes you triumph in suffering, and that's what we're going to look at today. The truth of the matter is that Scripture teaches us there are two ways to triumph through faith. One way is obtaining the victory through faith in God, and we always like that one. And then there's the other way, persevering through suffering, through faith in God. And that one is a little harder for us to deal with. But the same faith that, it, uh, that makes you triumphant in victory makes you triumphant in suffering. And so verse 35 through 38 um, finishes up this section, and it gives us three additional examples of faith. All three of them emphasize triumphant being triumphant in faith through suffering. So we're going to talk about faith. It overcomes physical persecution. It overcomes execution and death. And faith overcomes hardships of all kinds. So let's look first at this first set of examples. Faith overcomes um, um, physical persecution. Look at verse 35, and I'm going to read the part that we did last week, and then we'll go into this week's. Verse 35 began this way. 
women receive back their dead, raised to new life again. And then he continues on. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. See what he did there? Some of these received their dead, raised back to life, while others were tortured and they refused to be released. One group was triumphant in victory in this same verse. Others were triumphant in suffering through faith. The word tortured in verse 35 um, here comes from a Greek word, uh, tamponon. It, it means a drum. It's the word we get timpani from. A common form of torture in those days was to be um, stretched tight on a rack, like the skin of a drum being stretched on the top of that drum. That's why the word is used here for torture. Verse 35 says, They were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. That's an interesting phrase there. What does that mean, a, a, a better resurrection? Uh, let me just pause to say here to you, um, I'm becoming more and more aware how many times people say something, and I thought they said one thing, but what they meant was something different. And it's, it's, it's uh, difficult sometimes when we're talking. It is much more difficult when it's in a letter or an email. Have you ever misunderstood something somebody said? They either put a comma in or they didn't, or you read it with or without the comma, and it meant something totally different. Um, so we can get confused. When you read something in Scripture and it sure seems to be confusing, well, then dig a little farther. Get somebody to help you. Read a commentary and see what it um, says, because this is a little confusing here. They, they uh, were going to gain a better resurrection. What, what could that mean? Well, some people think, some of the ones interpret this, say it's a better reward that um, when they are resurrected to eternal life, meaning that some who are resurrected, those of us that are Christians, some that have, are resurrected, if they've suffered, they're going to get a, a better resurrection. It'll be better for them than it is for um, the rest of us. That's not impossible. Others think that when he's talking here, he's talking about um, the difference in the resurrection of the unrighteous, those that are not saved, versus the righteous, the Christians. And clearly that's going to be a better resurrection for the Christian than for the non-Christian. Here's what I think the best explanation of this verse is, and it really is pretty easy. We ought to at least look at the fact that in the first half of this verse, it says one thing, and in the second half of the verse, it has moved on to something else. Some women, it said, received back their dead, raised to life again. You know what that was? It was the resurrection. People that were dead were back to, to life, and so it was a resurrection. They came back, but they came back to this life with all the sorrows and the pains of this life. And it wasn't permanent because every single one of those people that was raised, they died again. So it wasn't a permanent resurrection. They died again. The better resurrection, the better resurrection will be the eternal life, the permanent resurrection. And you'll be free from all of the pain and the suffering of this world forever. So I think that's what he means here, that some were raised back to this life, and then they still had all of the aches and pains. Have you had anybody um, close to you that has died? I, I remember um, years ago, it was a 13-year-old girl um, that died, um, and I didn't do um, the funeral, and I was thankful for that. Someone else did the funeral, and they said something I really hadn't thought of before. Um, the guy that did the funeral, and the girl had been sick, she'd had cancer, so it had been a really painful struggle, but he said this to all of us and to the family. This little girl, if she could today, because of where she is, she would not come back. She would want you to come to where she is, but she would not come back. She would not, even with all the things that she might have wanted to do, she was in a far greater place. The scripture says it's a place we can't even um, think or describe. Um, if you, when you are resurrected to that place, if you had a choice, you would not come back. Not because you don't love the people here, but because the people, your Savior, the eternity that you're in is so much better. That is the better resurrection, even than being resurrected to what you thought you wanted to still do um, here. Um, the, uh, the verses, so um, uh, it goes on in this verse and it says, they also refused to be released. It literally means not having accepted the redemption. It's a phrase that implies um, uh, some kind of a ransom or a payment 
to be paid for your freedom. In other words, these people were offered some kind of freedom for some kind of price. But because that price was going to include denying God and his work, they refused it. They didn't want their freedom bad enough to deny God. Um, the verses might be referring, uh, the application there um, could be easy to understand, but they, they might be referring to the Maccabean Jews. They were a second century group, and there was a historical book of Second Maccabees. And let me just say to you, if you think that um, Second Maccabees or some other book is one of the lost books of the Bible, there are no lost books. All the books that are supposed to be in the Bible are in it. And so there's not some that you'll find later on, but there are some historical books. We certainly don't lean on them like we would Scripture, but they have some value and they will tell us some things. And so there is some historical data. Second Maccabees describes in great detail, much greater than I want to explain to you today, these seven Jewish brothers who underwent some terrible, gruesome, horrible torture and death rather than deny God. They were given an opportunity to be released, but they refused because of the hope and the certainty and the faith that they had in eternity and a resurrection to an eternal life. So here is the point. Only faith will ultimately help you to per persevere through suffering of physical persecution. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. You cannot see the better resurrection, but you are sure of what you hope for, and that's what gives you strength to go on. There are many, many Christians today around the world who suffer physical persecution. You cannot, uh, you cannot possibly say that their suffering is due to a lack of faith. That is the reason they are being persecuted, is because of their faith. And the reason that they are able to persevere is because of their faith, through faith. They know that there is more to this life than this life. They look forward to a better resurrection. Verse 36 goes on and gives us some additional examples of persecution, physical persecution. Verse 36 says, Some faced jeers and flogging, and still others were chained and put in prison. So we have jeers and flogging and chains and prison. Uh, the Greek word used here for jeers, it, it can mean uh, mocking, but it can also refer to brutality. Um, the seven Jewish brothers in uh, Second Maccabees, um, there's, descri there's a description of the second brother, um, and it talks about um, him being skinned and, and other things similar to that that were just um, terrible, terrible uh, treatment. And so, uh, and, and the reason I tell you that is, they use the same word in there for jeers. And so it can be um, you and I, um, somebody just making comments to you, oh, you can put up with that. It may mean much, much more than just um, um, some words. Examples of Old Testament believers that experience persecution um, include uh, the prophet Micah in the Old Testament. Micah was, it said, slapped in the face, insulted and sent to prison for telling the truth. Slapping in the face doesn't seem that bad unless you're the one being slapped. Um, and it can, be, it can be really bad. Um, and so being slapped in the face and then sent to prison for, for telling the truth. The prophet Jeremiah was beaten and put into prison. In the New Testament, Paul and the apostles suffered these same kinds of mistreatment. Even the, the recipients of this letter to the Hebrews were, were not strangers to persecution. In fact, in the previous chapter, chapter 10, we read these words uh, in chapter 10, picking, picking up in verse 32, it says, Remember those early days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in the great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. What if, the, what if Hebrews 11 had not included these examples of suffering in faith? Well, then the, re the readers might have wrongly assumed that they didn't have faith 
because they didn't have victory through great, well, through great victory, and they had this suffering. Um, so faith, it overcomes physical persecution. Another thing, faith not only overcomes physical persecution, but it also overcomes um, execution and death. Uh, look at the beginning of verse 37. It says, they were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. Uh, stoning was a very common form of execution. Uh, the Bible records uh, Zechariah, son of Jehoadad, the priest, was stoned to death. Um, according to Jewish tradition, the prophet Jeremiah was also killed by stoning while he was uh, living in Egypt. Uh, Jesus implied that the, the stoning of God's prophets was a common offense in Israel. Jesus uh, cried out in the book of Matthew in chapter 23, he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. Um, and then we have being sawed in two. Now, we'd, it's a very unusual way um, to be killed, and we don't have any examples of this in um, Scripture. We do have some uh, both Jewish um, uh, history books and uh, um, another source of Justin Martyr um, that talked about the prophet Isaiah being cut, um, sawed in half with a wooden saw during the reign of King Manasseh. Uh, and then there, was, there are those that were put to death by the sword. King Jehoiakim uh, killed the prophet Uriah with the sword during the days of Jeremiah. Uh, the New Testament, John the Baptist, was uh, beheaded. Um, now, last week we looked at verse 34, and it talked about those who escaped the sword through faith. Elijah escaped the sword along with a remnant of other prophets. But many of God's prophets did not escape the sword. They were put to death by the sword. Um, did they have less faith than Elijah? Um, and those that escaped? I think absolutely not. Um, God had a, a different purpose and plan for them through faith. We may be triumphant in victory, and we may be triumphant in suffering. Martyrdom for um, Christian faith continues today all around the world. It's not just part of ancient um, history. Um, here's the current reality. More Christians died for their faith in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries all put together. So it's not something old. Every single day, Christians around the world lose their lives because of their faith in Christ. We are unbelievably blessed to live where we are and have the freedoms that we have um, here to, to pray and together, just like we're gathering together today. And so faith, it overcomes physical persecution. Faith, it overcomes execution and even death. And then finally, faith overcomes hardships of all kinds. Look at verse 37, and then we'll go on into um, 38. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. Uh, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. This verse describes the hardship that um, many of the believers uh, experienced just because of their faith. Sheepskin and goatskin, that's, a, that's rough, simple clothing. Not anything fancy or delicate at all. It was the typical clothing um, for a prophet. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 13, he talks about a prophet's garment of hair. Um, we know that John the Baptist oftentimes wore uh, clothing made of camel's hair. And verse 37 goes on to describe them as destitute, poverty-stricken, having little or no earthly resources. They, they were described here as being persecuted and mistreated, which is telling us that they, were, they, were, they did nothing wrong. All of this treatment is what they are getting undeserved. They are getting this because they were telling the truth, because they were believing the truth, because they were doing right. They were ill-treated for doing right. Verse 38 says, the world was not worthy of them. Uh, the word that is translated here, worthy, it's a, it's a, mean, it's a word that means having um, the weight, uh, something of value. In other words, weighing the same in the scales. So the world considered them worthless, of little value, no value. But the truth is, 
the world was not worthy of them. When weighed in the scales of God's pleasure, these precious heroes who suffered for their faith outweighed the whole world. God is looking for people of faith who will dare to be triumphant in suffering. There, there's no shortage of volunteers who will sign up for um, the victory part of faith. But the real test comes when you encounter suffering. Verse 38 finishes by saying, They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. You know what this is describing? Homeless. They, 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 were, they were homeless. Biblical examples of homeless people. Um, David. There was a time when he was hiding from Saul. Uh, Obadiah hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in caves. Elijah hid from Ahab out in the desert. John the Baptist made his home in the wilderness. Even our own Lord, um, when he was here on earth, experienced homelessness. In Matthew chapter 8, he said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Poverty and homelessness um, are another part of the persecution that um, Christians around the world face today. Many Christians um, lose their jobs because of their faith, which means they've lost their income, and they may lose possessions because of their faith. Some are removed or displaced from their homes or villages. And once again, they are not suffering um, because of a, a lack of faith. They are suffering because of their faith. They refuse to let go of their faith in Christ. The world is not worthy of them. I hope between um, last week and this week's a message, you can grasp that the, the, the main thrust of the message um, last week and this week again is that biblical faith is triumphant in both victory and in suffering. Of course, the, the ultimate example of this was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who suffered and died on a cross to pay the price for your sins and mine. And he rose victorious over sin and death forever for you and for me. Um, the biblical faith, biblical faith is triumphant both in uh, victory and in suffering. Now, uh, here's the thing. We don't get to choose which one of these ways God may use us, which one we will experience, being triumphant through faith. Um, it's up to God. It's not up to you and me. We should seek to have the best attitude, the attitude like what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Um, they displayed this in the, the face of the possibility of being thrown into that fiery furnace. And I love this this passage out of Daniel chapter 3. Um, here's what they said to the king. You'll remember that um, they were being ordered to bow down to um, uh, and worship um, a statue. It was only for 30 days. It was 30 days. They weren't going to give up um, their worship of their God, and they weren't going to worship any other God. And here's what they said um, to the king. And, and when I read this, I, I just noticed that, that they were not ugly to the king. Maybe had good reason to. They seem to continue to be very respectful of him. I'm not sure he, well, I'm, I am sure. He was not impressed with their being respectful to him. But, but here's what they said. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of, God, of gold that you have set up. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God will save us through victory. But even if he doesn't, we will still serve him. Now, they didn't use all these words, but they were saying, eh, he will, we will serve him in victory. We'll serve him in suffering. If death is what comes, then God will use that. Um, when, when it says in Romans, that he works all things together for good. It's his good he's working together for. All things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you're working on his purpose, he will use to his best interest the things in your life. 
And we like it when those are the victorious. But we usually come close to claiming the victory for us. It, you, don't, you seldom claim the victory in suffering. Um, trust in God. Faith will overcome the world. And sometimes it is in a victorious way, and sometimes it is through suffering. But he will get the victory either way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your um, love. And again, this week, as we've opened your um, word, um, we are reminded that it is our faith in you and then your work, however you choose to do that. Uh, this morning, I would just ask you, as, as Jane plays for just a moment, w would, would you just pause and pray? There have been, all of us have had some trials and difficulties, tragedies, um, either in our own personal life or uh, our, our hearts have been broken because of uh, things that have happened in the lives of those around us. M most of us have not experienced someone being uh, stoned um, or uh, horribly tortured and killed, but there are lots of things that attack us. Um, words are very strong. A slap in the face, whether literally or just figuratively, is difficult. And it can cause us to question why we would continue to have faith. Um, would you pause just a moment and thank God for the faith that he really has given you and ask him to increase your faith even right now? God, I thank you for all of the um, all of the stories that you have placed for us uh, in your word. Uh, many times we read of people that failed, um, not not just these that have been mistreated and and suffering, but we read so many stories of of people that if we were writing this book, we we perhaps would have left them out because they're they're um, well, they're they're difficult, they're terrible stories, they're they're m murderous, they're, they are they are terrible stories. I, I thank you for all the, those stories that you have included so that we can see that these people in Scripture are real because they are just like us. I do thank you today that as we have enjoyed walking through this chapter of, uh, of heroes of the faith, I, I thank you for including these that had less than desirable outcomes, some who lost their life, literally, because of their faith and trust in you. Um, I thank you that, that we don't suffer. Uh, we don't suffer the persecution. Uh, we don't suffer the persecution that many other people in our world suffer today. Um, I thank you that we've not been subjected to that, but I pray that you would not allow that to make our faith slight, um, that it is something we can take or leave because it's not challenged at all. Uh, I thank you for how you use victory to encourage our hearts and how even the times of suffering that if we if we just will hold on you will show us um, how in your perfect timing uh, you will get the benefit from all that we struggle through so i pray as we struggle with um, hardships in this life that you would help us to keep our faith strong keep it in you um, help us to trust in your word uh, surround us with people who will encourage our hearts in those times when we are um, uh, dealing with difficulties um, so that our faith will be strong, not just so our heart will feel better, but so others will see the victory that comes in our life, even during the times of suffering. I pray that some would see how we suffer well and want whatever it is that we have placed our foundation in to give us that kind of strength and that we can then tell them 
about the saving grace that is found only in you. It's to that end that I pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thank you for being here today. One more message in uh, Hebrews. We'll finish that up next week, and then we'll be to Easter Sunday. You remember what you were doing last Easter Sunday? I don't know, but you weren't here because we didn't meet last Easter Sunday. We weren't able to uh, gather together. So I'm looking forward to um, um, next week and to Easter Sunday joining uh, together. So uh, thank you for being here. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks.